Now it's time to introduce our two speakers. Robert Nordland is the president of Association Reserves and a registered professional engineer. Robert is also a certified reserve specialist, was involved in creating National Reserve Study Standards, and has greatly influenced this industry for the past 25 years. He regularly writes on the topic of reserve studies and speaks at industry functions throughout the nation. Association Reserves has prepared over 25,000 reserve studies for association-governed communities throughout the United States. Robert is often called to serve as an expert witness in litigation involving reserve issues. Kevin Davis is the president of Kevin Davis Insurance Services, Inc., currently the managing general agent for Travelers Insurance and is one of the largest riders of specialty insurance coverage for community associations in the country. His firm currently insures over 40,000 community associations and is the largest writer of community association DNO insurance throughout the United States. Kevin has worked in the insurance industry for over 35 years, focusing on community associations for the past 30 years. From a startup in 2000, now 65 people work for Kevin Davis Insurance. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Robert Nordland. Robert? Well, thank you very much, Chris. This is Robert. Say hello, everyone. Uh, Kevin? Hello there. Well, together, Kevin and I are going to have a conversation about DNO insurance and reserve studies. Some of these questions came up this spring when I was attending a legal seminar where the speaker only briefly touched on the, ability, the idea of liability exposures involved in the board member decision-making process. So I thought there was a lot of material there, a lot of depth that hadn't been explored. So I contacted Kevin Davis, a national expert in the field of directors and officers liability insurance and someone I've known for many years. And between our two schedules, it's taken uh, quite a while until we could actually find a date to put this session together for you. So I believe we've got a special treat for you today. Uh, while we expect to answer the questions presented in the webinar outline that you all received in registering, I want to make sure this time is valuable for you. So on your screen, you'll see a dialog box. If you've come with a question, or if at any time a question comes to mind, please type it into the dialog box, which Chris will be monitoring. We'll try to answer as many as we can in the time available after we've finished our prepared curriculum. In addition, there's a hands raised icon that allows you to respond to a question we might ask. So let's start off with some audience participation. Kevin and I are used to speaking in front of a live audience. We can't see you, so grab your mouse and click the hands raised icon to tell us you're here, you're ready, and uh, eager to start the program. Okay, I'm seeing the hands raised go up. Very good. Kevin, we've got a good crowd with us today. Good. That's okay, good. I'm going to put to everyone's hands down and uh, get on with the program here. So, Kevin, let me start out with, um, what is DNO insurance? Okay, um, when we talk about DNO insurance, we're talking about directors and officers liability insurance. And directors and officers liability insurance is basically peace of mind insurance for boards of directors. As a member of a not-for-profit board of directors, your job is to make decisions. I mean, it can be as simple as enforcing the rules or funding the reserves. The problem is that when a unit owner, renter, contractor, other board member, or property manager doesn't like the decisions that you make, they can file a claim against you. Now, usually these disgruntled individuals either want the board of directors to either do something or stop someone from doing something. For example, we have this Hidden Valley Lakes Association. They have a strict no pet policy. However, the owners of Unit 16B has a dog. Now, the board tried to enforce the no pet rule, but the owner says it's a comfort pet and the rule doesn't apply to them. A claim is then filed by the owner of Unit 16B against the board because the no pet rule is unreasonable. <coughs> because they had a doctor's note. Now, this is a typical DNO claim. It's not a large monetary judgment like a personal injury loss or a property damage loss, but we're talking about just the cost 
to defend the claim. Directors and officers, insurance protects the directors and officers of the association in the event there's a claim against them for a wrongful act for their role in managing the association. Let me follow up on that, Kevin. What is a wrongful act? Okay. The wrongful act itself is the actual decision that the board makes. You know, uh, when you look at a policy, a wrongful act is any act or omission. That is any act. Anything the board does, anything the insurer can do that can be, they can be held liable for is what a wrongful act. Meaning things like conflict of interest, failure to abide by the governing documents, failure to properly handle elections, challenge to assessments, failure to maintain a common area, these all lead to costly DNO claims. Unit owners and others will constantly challenge the authority of the board, which leads to a DNO claim. And does it uh, does DNO insurance cover the board members that you speak about, or is it managers also? Well, and that's the important thing because when you talk about direct and officer liability insurance, most of the time you talk about just the board of directors. But what you want to do is make sure that the DNO policy that you purchase extends to the community association manager, your past board of directors, your volunteers, and your committee members. You have to make sure everybody who has exposure serving on the board is covered, meaning that the board should, ex it should extend not only to the past and present, but to your budget committee, your architectural review committee, the volunteer that changes the life of. Everybody should be covered under your um, director and also liability policy. Well, it sounds like what you're describing is something that can be either very narrow or wide, both over who it covers and also over the, the time it covers. So there's got to be uh, different categories of DNO coverage. Can I get you to explain the different categories? Well, yes, because the problem with directors and officers coverage is that there is no standard DNO policy. You can't say, I want the standard DNO policy like you can a standard auto policy or a standard property policy. What we're talking about is two types. The type you get in your package, where it's bundled together and includes your um, crime and liability and property coverage, or there's a standalone policy. The difference is cost and coverage. The best overall coverage is the standalone policy that is designed for community associations, because most package policies that are out there are very restrictive and exclude many necessary coverages needed to protect you as a community association board member. Which you spoke about just a moment ago in um, perhaps that narrow coverage might exclude committee members and other people and may even exclude you after you're off the board when you're crossing your fingers and hoping that uh, a lawsuit isn't going to go catch you. Exactly. Okay. Well, how do you establish the, um, the cost of DNO you know, insurance? Okay. The rate is based on the number of units, with the theory that if you have 30 units, that means you have 30 potential people who can sue the board of directors for decisions they made or did not make. So that's what our number one consideration is, the number of units. But we also take into consideration the number of employees, the actual value of the unit itself, and where it's located. Therefore, a high-rise condo with 30 units and 20 employees on Miami Beach will pay a lot more money than a 30-unit condo um, with no employees anywhere else in the country. Fantastic. So it is proportional to the risk, which is, of course, what I as a consumer, I always want to pay only for what uh, I'm exposed to. Now, is that a large cost or a small cost? And um, Well, yeah, uh, is it a large cost or a small cost? Okay. Well, the average premium on a DNO policy is about $1,000 for $1 million of coverage. And this is, provides very comprehensive coverage. So that I means a lot of coverage for $1,000, a $1 million dollar limit. All right, now, the problem though is that the rates are on the rise uh, because the claims, we're seeing more and more claims uh, against board of directors of condominiums. How does an association keep their premiums low? Okay, and that's one thing we want to talk about today. This is, this is really important because the way to stop the claims from going up is for board of directors to make better decisions. Because the better decisions they have, the, the easier it is to get out of lawsuits, and as a result, we'll keep DNO claims down. Got it. Do all associations have DNO coverage? 
And that's another problem. A lot of boards out there do not believe they need you know, coverage. They think they know everybody who lives in their association. They're all friends or they've been living there for 10, 15 years. The problem is that once that person moves away and you get a new person in there, everything changes. Now, there's no law that mandates DNO, but you should have some type of DNO insurance no matter how limited. Well, we've been talking about the need for DNO insurance and for the decisions a board makes. Can you spend a moment to talk about the kind of responsibilities board members have and if, um, what their overall responsibility is defined as? Well, I mean, overall, the board member's responsibility is to protect, maintain, and enhance the asset of the corporation. I mean, that means you have to, you have to look at the ongoing affairs of the associations. They have to hire vendors, managers, make financial decisions. The main thing is that they have to understand that their association is a business. It's a multi-million dollar business. And they have to treat it that way. The problem is they end up treating it like it's a hobby. Um, that's something that I enjoyed uh, working through as we were beginning to prepare for this session. And one of the things we talked about was the types of decisions that an uh, a board member could make, ranging from the wise business decisions to just uh, foolish, uh, casual decisions and foolish decisions that you can make when it's simple or just something that, as you mentioned, is a hobby. Um, can you elaborate on this point for a minute? Yeah. The, the, when, when boards of directors are sued in, for community, in a community association, judges look at the decision they made. It's not a matter of was it a good decision or a bad decision. They look at how did they arrive at the decision. Did they use professionals? Did they use outside people to get the decision? And if it's a wise decision, it's easily defendable in a court of law. On the flip side, if it's a foolish decision or a casual decision, those are more difficult to defend. And if you're in those positions, you're talking about it can lead to very expensive jury verdicts. I mean, it's easy to send the board of directors when they fully fund the reserves. But when they decide that because I'm 80 years old and I don't care what the roof looks like 20 years from now, we're not going to fund it, well, that may sound right emotionally, but when it comes to going to court of law, it's their job to treat it as a business and be concerned about the organization 20 years from now. So as we were talking about this in the last few days, those wise decisions are easily defensible, and hopefully uh, there won't be very many people eager to challenge them. But on the opposite end, the foolish decisions a board made, makes are more easily challenged, they cause more trouble, and um, a right-minded homeowner might even argue that such a decision would be rightfully challenged. Is that somewhat uh, a correct characterization? Exactly, because what happens is that on these wise decisions we're talking about, they're uniform. That means no matter who's in front of you, you're going to act the same way. When you talk about a casual or foolish, you talk about an arbitrary decision, especially when it's casual or foolish. You're talking about if you park your car in visitor's parking and you have to be the nice person in the association, guess what? You don't care. But if you happen to be that one person in the association, nobody likes, and every association out there has that one person, as soon as they park in there, you arbitrarily tow that person's car away, you didn't do your due diligence, you didn't do the right job, you didn't make a wise decision, then you're talking about a costly claim. Not only in terms of dollars, but in terms of your emotional energy you put out on it. Okay, and there's one more step that we spoke about in uh, preparing for this session. Uh, as you go from wise to casual to foolish, there's one additional step, and that's the decisions where someone is perhaps out to get someone or intentionally oversteps their bounds and making a wrong decision. Can you touch on that for a moment? Yeah, and that's the, that's the worst, because at least if you're wise, casual, or foolish, you can end up with defense costs. You can end up defending your decision, no matter how poor the decision is. But when it's intentional, that's when they can come back and not only provide, provide no coverage. Now you're talking about it coming out of your own pocket, the money coming out of your own pocket to defend yourself. So the intentional decisions, the purposeful violations, those are the type of situations that you really, really got to watch out for, because then there's no coverage available at all. Got it. Okay, well, let me turn the question over to everyone in the audience here. Grab your uh, mouse and let me ask, do you understand that what we're going to talk about today, we've laid the groundwork that the spectrum of decisions is going to range from wise through to casual to foolish all the way to intentionally uh, willful wrong decisions. That's kind of the groundwork that we're going to set for the rest of the discussion. So 
click the hands raised icon if you're with us in understanding that uh, this is the spectrum that we're going to be speaking about today. All the way from wise through foolish and hopefully avoiding those intentional decisions. Okay, great. I believe everyone's with us. Okay, I'm going to put hands down and move us on to the next slide. So, um, as we're talking about decisions and um, the way we make decisions, let's focus on the financial decisions a board makes, specifically reserve budget decisions. That's bottom line what brings us together today. Reserve contributions for the typical association represent 15 to 40 percent of their total budget. So it's usually one of their largest budget line items and the line item that is responsible for the association's future. So let's presume a real situation. A board's making a budget for the association, setting homeowner assessments for the upcoming year, and they find that the assessments they're hoping to set just doesn't provide enough income for the ongoing expenses. They have to cut the expenses way back. That means the property is going to fall into disrepair. Maybe the water bill doesn't get paid. Maybe someone else doesn't get, doesn't get paid. So in this type of situation, if an owner there feels the board isn't doing their job to take care of the common areas, is this the kind of situation where the board might get sued? Yes. This is a very common type of claim on directors and officers. It is called breach of fiduciary duty. There is a fiduciary duty that you have as a board member of a community association. I mean, association board of directors must exercise a degree, a degree of care and loyalty required of a fiduciary officer or director of a corporation. Courts often apply what's called a reasonable standard in testing their actions. So whenever there's a situation where you're sued, like this for the, you know, for the property falling into um, disrepair, you're talking about the board of directors that's breached their fiduciary duty. So in the course of running the association, as the board sets the budget and someone challenges the wisdom of it, that's the type of decision where when they get challenged, the DNO insurance would kick in and provide a defense for the board being sued. Exactly. It is a wrongful act which is committed where they, they're challenging the board's authority. When they're challenging the board, it's a wrongful act, and so a claim is being filed. Now, what I want to do is take a second and talk about what is a claim. A claim is a written demand for monetary or non-monetary relief. It's a civil proceeding commenced by a service of a suit or a criminal proceeding commenced by return of indictment. So it's all different types of things, but it's a, something in writing where you're challenging that board of directors saying they committed a wrongful act. If you ever get something like that or you think it's a claim, you must report it to your insurance carrier. And knowing what I know from the outside, it's the fact that anyone can make a claim for any reason. Yes. Got it. Okay. What if a board makes an absolutely foolish, um, indefensible decision? Let's say they um, actively discriminate or make a self-serving decision or they make a decision that's illegal or goes against their powers. Uh, what are the limits? I think you briefly touched on that, but I want to make sure everyone caught that. What's the limits to well, their defense being covered by DNO insurance? Well, see, this is a tricky thing because what will happen is, is that, um, and, and, the, and the perfect example is discrimination. You see a lot of discrimination lawsuits in community associations. That one person whose car you towed away earlier, he'll come back and say, you didn't tow my car away because I'm that one guy in the association nobody likes. You're going to say that I'm a protected class and I'm being sued, and I'm being targeted and discriminated against. Now, everybody falls into protected class now. But once you do some of these things that, that are intentional, you know, there's no coverage. But we don't determine from an insurance point of view was it intentional or not. You do get defense costs until the judge comes back there and say you clearly discriminated, you clearly in violation of the law. Therefore, not only is no more coverage, but we get to go back after you for the defense costs we already paid. Yikes. So in that scale that we talked about, we really do want to encourage clients to be at the wise end of the scale and away from that foolish edge where it turns into an intentional uh, wrongful act. Exactly. Okay. Well, what if the board uh, takes a step forward uh, trying to do something wise and gets professional counsel, but they go against that professional counsel? Is that a situation where the board members would be defended? 
Well, it, 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 it depends where it lines at. There should be some defense in there, and it'll probably be defense there no matter what. Okay, but if, again, it goes back that they, if it's truly uh, something intentional, purposeful, where they sit back there and say they know they're in pure violation of a state statute, then there'll be no coverage at all. But they sit back there and say, as board of directors, we are not going to do X, Y, and Z. We're not going to fund the reserve anymore. We're not going to collect assessments as high as we'd like to. You still get defended, but again, the problem is that it's the long-term effect of being on the board and have to be sued. And that's the emotional energy you're going to spend trying to get out of the lawsuit. So you may be defended, but it's just going to be a, a whole bunch of lost time and anguish. It's just a bad situation you want to avoid if at all possible. And that's the key. It's not so much as being defended. Yes, if you make a wise decision, the lawsuit can be thrown out pretty very, very quickly. But if you make a casual decision, or you make an intentional decision, those things last three to five years, and all of a sudden you're investing a lot of your emotional time and energy into the lawsuit. Got it. Well, are there other areas where an association typically needs professional counsel? You know what? We always recommend that board of directors, you, you, it's a corporation and you're managing a corporation, you seek outside professional help. I don't care if it's legal and management, which is the most common, but we're also talking about um, insurance professionals, you're talking about, you know, the pool service provider, the janitorial service, all these are, can help you, help you, and even, what's even greater is you can get help from your reserve studies provider. I mean, because that's the clearest because it's written recommendations and often disclosed to all the unit owners out there. Well, Kevin, let me take another quick break here and make sure the audience is with us. Uh, we've been taught, we laid this foundation of the uh, different types of decisions wise, casual, foolish, and intentionally uh, wrongful decisions. And I just want to make sure everyone is understanding that that's the framework that we're going to talk about when wise decisions are reflected by getting help where appropriate. So we want to encourage wise decisions and sometimes and perhaps quite often that means seeking outside help. Can I get a hands raised to see if the audience uh, is following along, understanding that we're encouraging wise decisions and trying to make a wise decision decision often means getting outside advice great okay they're following along okay uh, thank you very much now uh, there's 30 states with 30 states with some form of reserve study or reserves disclosure requirements. Kevin, what happens if the board decides not to fulfill their state requirements and either fails to update their reserve study or doesn't have their appropriate disclosures ready for the um, homeowners? Is DNO insurance going to protect the board from that type of claim? Well, that's one of the, that's one of the areas where you probably won't get protection because um, whenever you're in violation of any state statute, you're in violation of the law, and that's uninsurable. Got it. Okay, so that's an example of one of those willf or intentionally uh, wrong. Willful. Uh, yeah, willful. I'm sorry. Uh, you've gone across the line. Okay. Well, no matter what state law says, it does take a lot of money to adequately care for the association's common areas. What kind of exposure does the board have if they fail to get a reserve study update, um, just sticking their head in the sand, uh, avoiding learning the facts, and just ignoring their entire situation? What we've seen in this area is something really different and unique, and that is, is that the board of directors today can make decisions that will impact them two or three years from now, meaning that they can sit back there and say, we're not going to fully fund reserve because we don't believe we can afford it. But three years from now, you have a new board of directors that gets into power, and they look at the fact that the reserve's not funded adequately, they need, they need new roofs, they can't afford it, and they go back after the old board who had the reserve study and fail to do anything about it. So your big exposure today is not when that board makes a decision, it's three years later when that new board comes in and says, we don't like the decision you made. Got it. And are there situations where the board gets a reserve study and they can claim to wisely choose to not follow it? Um, they, can, they can choose not to follow it, but again, it's not a wise decision. It's one of those foolish decisions that leads to all different kind of problems. You know, um, 
they can come back and say reserve studies are made up of estimates and, um, and, and there's a lot of different problems that comes into it, but it goes back to the simple thing. If you make that wise decision, the likelihood of you being defended is greater versus making an arbitrary decision saying that, you know, we're not going to follow it. And that's an arbitrary decision that leads to those costly um, judgments and settlements that we talked about. Got it. Well, one of the uh, challenges we get <clears throat> when boards say, but we don't want to follow your reserve study, I want to make sure everyone here knows that when you don't like the reserve study, that's one thing, but when it's inaccurate, when its uh, fact base is not correct, uh, our company and I believe most reserve study companies across the country have a revision policy because we do want the board to have that guidance, the accurate guidance they need in order to make informed decisions. Um, but to, let me ask Kevin, once a reserve study has been adjusted and tuned, um, revised as needed to reflect the physical and financial reality that once it's got a good grasp on the facts, uh, tell me about the board that chooses to make a lower reserve contribution than needed by the association. Is that what you were talking about, the today versus tomorrow short-term decision? Exactly, and that's the problem you're going to have is that it's easy to make that decision today and say that we can't do it, but boy, what happens is that three years later, you end up, or five years later, you can end up that new board of directors saying, you made a mistake, it's going to be a costly mistake because now all of a sudden there needs to be a special assessment. We don't want to have special assessment, a special assessment, and guess whose fault it is? The board who made a bad decision three years ago. Yeah, the previous board. Well, <clears throat> the problem with reserve contributions is it may seem like a, a short drop now, but it often ends up in, uh, as you said, cramping the uh, board's ability to make the necessary improvements a few years later. And you end up with associations where their asphalt will look like this. Uh, and just a problem because you've tied the hands of the board that they just don't have the money they need. What we're trying to encourage here is wise decisions, wise decisions that lead to successful associations, successful communities where they have the money to be able to perform the timely maintenance without uh, reliance on special assessments. Um, but uh, let me be real specific on that. Kevin, if a board chooses to under-reserve to keep their assessments low, making that short-term decision, is that a decision that would be defended by DNO Insurance? Well, you know, every association has to pay its bills and maintain a common area and a common good, okay? So the board has made a decision to, to operate this way. Um, is it a well-thought decision, number one? I mean, it has to be a well-thought decision because you're going to have a wise decision because they um, did not fund, they couldn't afford to do it right now. The problem is it's hard to do that because the association, the association board can do something that most of us can't do, and they can go after the individual unit owners for special assessment. And when they choose not to do it, they make decisions that really can cause them uh, more harm than good in the long run. They have to make those decisions today to make sure that they fully fund the reserve, to make sure they're fully doing the job as, as best they possibly can, so that they avoid them um, problems and headaches down the road. I like that phrase you used, as best they possibly can. Sometimes a board's hands are tied, but they want to be wise in doing the best job they can and not just the emotional short-term decision that you mentioned uh, moments ago. Exactly. Okay. Well, we get uh, a little bit of pushback associations asking how much wiggle room they have, how much can they move their uh, reserve contribution rate without getting themselves into problems. And unfortunately, that's usually a small number. It's usually in the range of 10%. So if we recommend a reserve contribution of about $5,000 a month for the association, typically they've got a little bit of wiggle room, and I'll use again the the value 10%, so they might be able to go down to 4,500 without really uh, damaging the financial situation at their association. So there's really not a lot of uh, wiggle room there for the board to move. The, uh, the, act, the movement point from their reserve contribution is often just in the 10% range. Okay. Hmm. I mean, is there a way for the board to know or measure their special assessment risk and possibly see how they change from one year to the next? Uh, that's a good question. When they are 
funding adequately or inadequately, it can be measured. Let me show you this chart. Um, as you can see along the left, you can see the percent funded. It ranges from the top in the red zone at zero, and as you go down the screen, it goes to 100% funded. And on the right, it shows the risk of special assessment. So as your percent funded gets lower and lower, as your eyes go up the chart, you can see the risk of percent funded goes up. And no surprise, um, when you don't have much money, when the reserve fund is weak, there's a high chance of special assessments. So following your percent funded value, seeing it go up through the years or down through the years is a very good measure uh, indicator, kind of a road map on if you're moving forward or backwards with respect to having a a strong or weak reserve fund. Hmm. Uh, is this a national chart or is it just like for large associ associations? Or what? Tell me about the chart. Well, it is a, a national chart. We ended up splitting this data out by size of association, by uh, East Coast versus West Coast, by uh, condo versus townhome versus uh, homeowners associations, and they always came up the same. The common denominator is the human factors, things that you've been talking about, Kevin. The, uh, it all boils down to board members making decisions. Um, basically, the roof always needs to get replaced. The only question is if it will be paid by the 20 years worth of people that were enjoying the roof, or if it's that unfortunate game of musical chairs where only the owners there, when the roof needs to get replaced, are going to get caught holding the bag and get special assessed. But that sounds to me like the kind of situation where if you're a brand new owner and you get special assessed for a roof project, isn't that kind of the trigger that would cause uh, an owner to want to sue the board? to Because uh, um, it really shouldn't be their problem. Exactly. And that's why we encourage the financial responsible financial behavior. I mean, we can't stop those new people from suing. Okay, we can't stop them from being upset, but we can encourage a kind of behavior that lowers the board's litigation exposure. Okay, well, uh, let me add one more thing here. We've talked about reserve contributions. We talked about percent funded. From my point of view, let me introduce the third part of a reserve study, and it's the reserve component list. It defines the scope and schedule of the reserve projects, and it shows the list of components, their useful life, remaining useful life and the current replacement costs. And this is the kind of thing that when disclosed to all the homeowners, they get the sense that the board is acting wisely and making informed decisions, which uh, lowers their likelihood, as you indicated, of being, well, they still might be upset, but it lowers the likelihood of them thinking that the board's gotten in for them and they're doing careless things with their hard-earned money. Is that uh, Correct, and um, well, what else can a, a board do to, to minimize their liability exposure? I mean, one the, the key thing is the, the board of directors have to know what their job responsibilities are serving on, on a not-for-profit condominium association board. They have to follow state laws. They have to understand and know the governing documents. They have to have due process for the rules and committees. I mean, there's no end. Um, that's why we always encourage professional management and professional uh, people who specialize in community associations. You know, one of the problems we see is that people who live in community associations go to their relatives or their friends to get professional advice, and we recommend that they must go to somebody who understands community associations. It's, it's entirely different than any other type of industry. Got it. Well, let's focus on uh, reserve studies. I, I expect, from my point of view, that regular reserve studies are some of those prudent decisions. Um, the physical uh, condition of all the assets at the association are changing. The money in the reserve account is always changing. Do you like to see professional reserve study updates or uh, who uh, do you like to see doing the actual reserve study? I mean, again, the professionals are the ones we want to see. And not just professional specialists who specialize in, we want to see professional community, community association specialists involved. We don't see them updating association budgets. We want to see what's going on, but they have to understand what a community association is and what it's all about. There's too many people out there who call themselves professionals or understand it, but they're not credentialed. They don't really understand what they're trying to do. There's a lot of things out there that just, they just miss because there's not, um, they haven't had the education. 
Got it. Well, here in the, the credentials. Yeah, uh, here in the reserve safe field, we've got. Uh, let me share with the audience. There's two credentials. There's the reserve specialist uh, called the RS, and there's the professional reserve analyst PRA. So there's two credentials. So if you want to get a reserve study by a credentialed professional, the two credentials are very similar to each other. It's either the RS or the PRA. Look for that um, in the person that you're getting proposals from. Uh, Kevin, what do you think about the wisdom of paying for a reserve study from someone who doesn't have a credential? Yeah, and, and that's one of the problems you see is that, you know, somebody who doesn't have the credentials will be cheaper. And you have the association out there who will say, I can get a better deal because this person's not licensed, they're not credentialed, they don't have the the name, they don't have the experience, but it's cheaper. As a board of directors of condominiums, you cannot go with the cheapest because you will pay for it somewhere down, somewhere down the line. You have to go and you have to make the wise decision today because it, it will take care of you in the future. The arbitrary enforcement of the documents or arbitrary enforcement um, is what hurts the community association most and that comes from casual or foolish decisions that the boards make every day. And that brings us back to the key points we've been talking about. Trying to stay near the wise end of the decision scale and stay away from the foolish end of the decision scale. So let's just recap. Uh, will DNO Insurance help defend board members in the general process of their annual budget preparation? Yes, if there's a claim against the board of directors for improper budgeting, yes, then you have a DNO suit and you have defense and probably a settlement could be. And it all uh, the length of time for that turmoil is based on how wise or how foolish the decision was and how clear the fact case is on the matter. Exactly. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one more. Should um, board members expect that their DNO insurance will defend them if they choose to under-reserve? Um, again, it's possible depending on the situation. There may be, there, there probably will be some fence, defense up, up front. The key thing is it intentional or is it in violation of a state law? Why did they do? Why did they make the decision or not? If they did, we can come back in and say not only there's no coverage, but we can go back after them for the defense costs that was spent. Got it. And again, encouraging them to be back towards the wise end of the decision scale. Well, uh, Kevin, we're at the end of our time here. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day and for the the time that we spent preparing for this. I've enjoyed it just very much. I. Uh, on behalf of the audience, I just want to say uh, this has just been a, a great time. Um, Kevin and I have built our careers on helping associations make wise decisions. So we want to leave a trail and have for many years been successful in that, helping our clients make wise informed decisions for the good of their associations, leaving successful communities. I see that among my clients as communities with roofs that are watertight, you know, basically the physical and financial side, and Kevin sees that more on the decision side, the peace versus turmoil. So if you want some more information about a standalone DNO policy with the breadth and the width that can provide some good coverage for your association, I encourage you to go to Kevin Davis's company, Kevin Davis Insurance, which is on the website www.kdisonline.com and at our company's website um, for association reserves it's reservestudy.com. You'll find there under the uh, client center tab some great information, uh, other webinars, uh, announcements of future webinars and on our home page there's a place to uh, sign in for the email newsletter to make sure that if you didn't get this invitation that you can get it next time. So uh, I want to now at this point in time turn the floor over to Chris and with the time remaining have her act as the moderator for a few questions that uh, you as the audience have typed in while we've been speaking. So Chris, back to you. Great, thank you Robert and Kevin. As I mentioned earlier, you can ask either one of our presenters a question by typing a question into the question box at the bottom of your control panel. And we have some here that have been waiting. Julie would like to know, um, a condo did not have a valid board for several years, and the management company served as the board. They did not tell the owners this. They paid DNO insurance, but there were no directors and officers. 
Was this wasted money? Wow, that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> I'll let very you answer that one. <laughs> because this is what happens now. The Director of Office of Policy says you have to be duly elected or appointed. If that Board of Directors has not been duly elected or appointed, yes, they've been wasting money. Okay, and Carl would like to know, when an owner sues the Board of Directors, is the award just for the legal fees or the full amount of correction, such as a new roof? Ah, okay. This, uh, what happens here is we've been talking mostly about defense costs because most of the time when there's a DNO claim, we're talking about defense, defending it. Because once there's a judgment or settlement, it's usually something that could be excluded because it is about the new roof or it is about something that the, the policy is not designed for. Design, the policy is not designed to make the association better. It's to protect the board of directors for decisions that they, the bad decisions that they made. So if that judgment comes down and says that you know, you, you're fair to maintain a common area, you mean you have a million dollar judgment to repair and replace the fences and, and replaster the pool, then they will, what we call issue a reserve your reservation of rights letter where they reserve the right to defend it, but not reserve the right to, to pay for all those damages. All right. What if the board doesn't take a manager's recommendation to raise dues or perform a reserve study? Um, the board does not have to take a manager's recommendation, but what happens is, is that you end up being in that area of a full decision versus a wise decision. If if they decide not to go with a recommendation and it comes up to be a fool's decision, then you're talking about a two or three or four or five year long battle in the courts, them trying to defend, trying to defend a fool's decision. And that's the problem. It's not so much not being defended as much as the emotional energy is going to take to defend a fool's decision. Okay, and Mary would like to know, can you explain the difference between full funding and adequate reserve funding? Kevin, I'll That's jump. You, Robert. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. <laughs> uh, full funding is when the cash in reserves equals the deterioration of the reserve components. Kevin has talked about full funding being a smart decision, but it's basically as things deteriorate, you put in cash to offset that deterioration. So when the association is new, the assets have very little deterioration. It doesn't take much reserve cash in the bank to be fully funded. Um, adequate reserves is often characterized as just planning to skim by with barely enough cash to do all the scheduled projects on time. Now my reminder is that it takes a lot of money to accomplish all the scheduled projects on time. So the difference between fully funded and adequate funding is really not a lot of difference. There's the contributions to be fully funded are a little bit higher, but they're often only higher by about 10%. All right, we have time for just one more question, and Howard would like to know, what if the board feels there should be an assessment or, or increase in dues, presents it to the association owners, and they vote, vote it down? All right, from an insurance point of view, I would say that they have a defensible position because they did their job, the board directors did their job, the best they could do it. And all they can do is sit back there and say, we did our job, but let's vote it down. So if they're sued, then um, it's defended, and then it should be a, short, a shorter time span for the actual lawsuit to go through. So I think they're better off doing it that way than ignoring the whole situation. All right, great. Well, thank you, Robert and Kevin. That concludes our webinar. If anyone's interested in a recorded version of this or any other webinar, you can search for them on YouTube or link to them via the speaker's websites. If you'd like to receive the speaker's newsletters or receive announcements of future webinars, please visit their websites and sign up. As you exit this webinar, a survey will display. If you could help us out by completing the survey, we'll be happy to email you an outline of the webinar. I want to thank you all for attending. If you have any questions or if there's any way we can be of service to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you again. Goodbye.